Hey, what's up? Hal here for another video on quantum computing. This video is part one of a series I am doing on quantum computing fundamentals. Today we're going to be learning about qubits, the fundamental resource in any quantum computer. All quantum algorithms work by manipulating the states of qubits. In order to understand the power of quantum computation, you first need to understand the mathematical tools and language we use to model and understand qubits behavior. In this video, I'm going to teach you just that. If you like this video, make sure to hit that like button and subscribe so you don't miss out on any of our upcoming videos in this series. As a beginner in quantum computing, I remember often being intimidated because I worried that with my lack of knowledge about quantum physics, there was no way I could understand quantum computers. However, I assure you this is not the case. All you need to understand quantum computing is some basic linear algebra. Quantum computing does not require knowledge of quantum physics, although it might help a bit. Before we get into anything, first I want to do a short refresher on linear algebra and some of the notation used in quantum computing. This right here is called a ket, and it essentially just represents a column vector, which is just a list of numbers stacked on top of each other. If we flip the notation, we get what is called a bra. A bra is a row vector, or a bunch of numbers aligned horizontally. You can switch between bras and kets by taking the transpose of the vector. We therefore call this notation bra-ket notation, and it's how we talk about vectors in quantum computing, something we will be doing a lot of. There are a couple of operations that can also be expressed in this notation. For this video, we just need to understand one thing, which is the tensor product. The tensor product is a way of combining vectors. In bra-ket notation, it can be written like this, with the tensor product symbol. However, it is often just written like this, with each vector being placed in one ket to simplify notation. So how do we take the tensor product of two vectors? Well, it's pretty simple, actually. We multiply each entry in the vector on the right by the first entry on the left. Then we move to the second entry on the left and multiply that by the entire vector on the right. While we are doing this, we place each new vector below the other. We repeat this for each value in the left vector, so our final vector will be equal to the length of the left vector times the length of the right vector. Let's work through an example here. Let's say we have the vector 1, 2, 3, and we want to take its tensor product with the vector 4, 5. First, we take 1 and multiply it by every entry in the other vector. So we get 1 times 4 and 1 times 5. Then we move on to 2. We get 2 times 4 and 2 times 5. And then we move on to 3. So we get 3 times 4 and 3 times 5. This gives us the vector 4, 5, 8, 10, 12, and 15. Pretty simple, right? Much like how binary is the computational resource of classical computers, qubits are the resource we use in quantum computing. A qubit is an abstraction of any two-level quantum system. For example, it could be the polarization of a photon, or the energy level of an electron in an atom with two orbitals. Fortunately, we do not have to concern ourselves with how a qubit is physically implemented. The math that describes each scenario is identical and surprisingly simple. To represent a qubit, we just need a vector of two numbers. Each value in this vector is related to the probability of measuring in a qubit in the state which we will interpret as being either a binary 0 or 1. Measuring a qubit is a destructive process, which will always yield either a 0 or a 1, and will leave our qubit in a state such that future measurements will be the same. From the values in the vector, we can calculate the probability of measuring a 0 or 1 by taking the square of the entries. The square of the first value is the probability of measuring a 0, and likewise, the square of the second value is the probability of measuring a 1. Because the square of these values are probabilities, this means that the sum of those squares must always be 1, or in other words, our qubit is always represented by a vector of length 1. Because we are taking the squares, these values can be positive, negative, and even complex. It may seem like that, while mathematically a complex or negative number is possible, it wouldn't actually make sense because in the end, our goal is to describe a real system. However, it turns out they are very necessary and show up in quantum physics all the time. The values in these vectors are called amplitudes. Two important states to remember are the 0 and 1 states, which are written like this, in ket notation. Their corresponding vectors are this. These states are important for a couple of reasons. Firstly, they are the only two states which have no randomness when performing measurement on them. The zero state always measures as zero, and the one state always is one. In quantum computing, we use these states to describe all other states. Any general state can be written as a linear combination of the zero and one state, like this. This general formula is equal to this vector, which can be thought of as the arbitrary quantum state vector. In quantum computing, we often denote this as psi. I want to note something here. When we measure an unknown state, we destroy the state, meaning we get a measurement result and our new state is left in either the zero or one state making repeated measurement identical. Because of this, we can never actually directly observe the amplitudes of the state. Therefore, it is not possible to build something which takes a quantum state and clones it. 
because it is impossible to get complete information about the state. This is called the no cloning theorem and it is a central principle of quantum mechanics. What if we are measuring two or more qubits though? Representing each of them through these vectors will quickly become unwieldy. If we had probabilities instead of amplitudes, we could just multiply them and get the probability, for example, of measuring zero twice. Fortunately, we can still do this. Amplitudes are similar to probabilities in this way. So when we take the tensor products of q qubit state vectors, we get a new vector of length 4, where each entry is the amplitude of the 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1 state, respectively. Now if we have 3 qubits, what can we do? The same thing! We can use the tensor product to combine any amount of qubits. If we have n qubits, the tensor product of the respective state vector will combine into a vector of length 2 to the n. Each entry will be the amplitude of the state starting from all zeros all the way to the state of all ones. Another way of thinking about this is that each amplitude is related to measuring some binary number between 0 and 2 to the n minus 1, counting up as we go down the vector. So here's a quick refresher on what we just learned. Qubits are any two-level quantum system. They are represented by a vector of amplitudes of length 2 to n, where n is the number of qubits in your system. These amplitudes allow us to calculate the probability of measuring some binary number when we measure our system by squaring them. Starting from the first entry, each amplitude is associated with a binary number starting at 0 and counting up. Let's look at an example. Say we have a two-qubit state vector that looks like this. The amplitudes in this vector are telling us that we have an equal chance of measuring a 0, 0 or a 1, 1 when we measure our quantum state. What we have right here is an entangled state. If you just measure one of the qubits, you will know with 100% certainty that you will measure the other qubit as the same value. We can tell that qubits are entangled when the vector of their amplitudes cannot be formed from the tensor product of two individual states. At first, this seems like a pretty trivial statement. But think about for a moment what this is telling us. If we have two entangled qubits, we have completely lost the ability to mathematically describe them as individual things because we can no longer decompose them into two qubit state vectors. This is a crazy concept. Entanglement and entangling operations lie at the heart of many quantum algorithms. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss some of my next video where I will show you how we can use quantum gates to create these kinds of entangled states. So the idea of a qubit is really just an abstraction of many different possible quantum systems. Fortunately, all of these quantum systems can be described by the same simple mathematical language. All we need is a couple of vectors, no complicated quantum physics required. And with that, I'm going to wrap this video up. I hope you enjoyed it. This was part one in a series on quantum computing fundamentals. If you did enjoy it, make sure you like and subscribe so you catch all of our upcoming quantum computing content.